Welcome to Heartland Online. I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend part of your day with us here to invest not only in your spiritual life, but also in your own health and in your relationships. If you haven't stopped to go get your Bible yet, then I would encourage you to do that or open it up, on, open your app up on your device. Or if you don't have a Bible, maybe go to wherever you purchase your apps and you can download a Bible from there. While you're at it, you might as well grab a pen and maybe you want to print off the downloadable notes uh, from where you downloaded this podcast. It's there. Or grab a journal or maybe just a scrap piece of paper. Surprises. How many of us like surprises? One of my favorites was my uh, surprise birthday party that Lori Ann threw for my 40th. We were invited, a couple days after my, my birthday, we were invited over to our friend's house. And so I was excited. I was looking forward to it. They, we go there. They invite us in. And we start to chat. Now, the husband is into the latest technology. And so he was telling me about his new theater system with a wall-to-wall screen and this new memory card that could carry, uh, that could hold virtually almost every movie a- a- available. Well, I thought that was pretty cool. I follow him up to the room. He walks in. And the moment that I walk in, this room just erupts with happy birthday. Wow, was I surprised. I had no idea. I'm an extrovert. I love parties. I have no idea how Lorianne and the kids pulled this off without any hint. Now, that may give you, you know, some clue about my observation skills, but I loved it. It was a great experience and a great night together uh, with friends and family there. There have been other great surprises, like when <clears throat> we got pregnant with our first child. We were the 0.00193% of people who get pregnant on the pill. That was us. He was a great surprise. But some people don't like surprises, period. Maybe you're one of them. Sometimes we can't control what surprises come our way, especially those, prizes, those surprises that aren't so good. That day, the mortgage broker tells you you don't qualify. The morning you walk out to your vehicle and you find it vandalized. Perhaps the time you sat across from the doctor and heard the C word as your diagnosis. Maybe it was that phone call informing you that you had just lost a loved one in an accident. You know, this weekend we come back to our series in the book of John. John is one of the 12 disciples uh, that were mentored by Jesus. And John and Jesus have a, a, a special relationship. John, of all of them, is probably the closest to Jesus. And a rather large section of this historical record documents specific details about the days leading up to what we would call Good Friday and Easter weekend. That fateful weekend where Jesus is arrested, he's falsely tried, he's beaten mercilessly, and then crucified. Today, we pick up up the events on the night that Jesus is betrayed. The concept of surprise is a common theme throughout this whole text. And so, as we work our way through these events, we will notice who was surprised and by what, how they responded, and what we can learn from them. Jesus and his disciples have just spent the last number of hours together <clears throat> eating supper, the, the supper meal. You may recognize it as the last supper. And our text begins in chapter 18, John 18, verse 1. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he, his disciples, went into it. Jesus has left the upper room where they had supper together, walked with his disciples through the streets of Jerusalem, and have now um, crossed the Kidron Valley. Now this valley is on the east side of Jerusalem and a few hundred feet below uh, the Temple Mount. It is called a wadi. In, um, in Arabic, it is a term for a ravine or a, or a canal that is dry except in the wintertime when there is water there. Because of these events occur late winter, early spring, there's probably a certain amount of water still running in this wadi. Well, this Kidron Valley not only um, has a rich history of events recorded in Scripture, but it also has spiritual significance in the future. I'll encourage you to go study that for yourself. Now, on the other side of this ravine is what is called the Mount of Olives. Some may call, some have called this a mountain ridge, but when we compare it to our Canadian Rockies, it's more like a bare hill with some olive groves on it, hence the name. 
There was a, on the western slope there, John merely mentions it as a, as a, this place as a grove, but we know from Matthew and from Mark that uh, uh, their rendering of Jesus' life and ministry, that it was actually called a garden. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane, and here's a picture of it. And because it says that Jesus entered the garden with his disciples and then later left, it suggests that, the, that this was an identifiable place. Perhaps even a walled private garden owned by a wealthy family in Jerusalem who allowed Jesus and his disciples to use it. We know that because in verse 2, John writes this. He says, Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas, as it says here, is the disciple that portrays Jesus. Judas is present while they are having supper together, but leaves early, leaves the upper room early to make these final arrangements to betray Jesus. Verse 3, Judas came there to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lamps, and weapons. By this time, it is late into the night. I surmise it's probably just before midnight. Judas is leading a detachment of soldiers. Now, some have said that this detachment or this cohort is about 200 men. Others have said it's up to 600. But add to them officials from the chief priests and Pharisees, which is like a, a religious sect at the time, and include some slaves that are mentioned later on, and you've got quite a crowd. Picture this, this enormous size and readiness of this arresting party. They're not just coming over for coffee. Evidently, they expect some pushback from Jesus and his disciples, or they expect to chase them through the, the, the mountainside as they run um, from their presence. But the disciples don't see them coming, nor even hear them. Because in another place, we read that they're actually sleeping while Jesus is praying some distance away from them. Late on this early spring evening, I imagine there's a cool breeze in the air. Jesus is about to get a surprise. Or is it? Let's read verse 4. Jesus, knowing that all was going to happen, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out. Jesus is not surprised. That John intentionally includes this line, knowing all that was going to happen to him emphasizes Jesus' omniscience or that he is all-knowing. This is a trait that only God possesses. And it demonstrates that he, is, he has complete mastery over the situation. These men, armed for battle, are not going to be seizing Jesus against his will. It says that Jesus went out to meet them. Jesus' voluntary surrender stresses again that he willingly laid down his life. It was not taken. He said earlier in John 10, verse 17, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for this is what the Father has commanded. This not-so-little encounter at the garden gate not only not surprised Jesus, but it was ordained. And Jesus knew it. Speaking to his disciples in the garden who had consistently fallen asleep, he tells them uh, in Mark 14, he says, he comes to them and he says, the time has come. The Son of Man, referring to himself, is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus knew it all along. In fact, it was him who exposed Judas's evil plan back in the upper room. During the supper that night, that's why Judas left early because Jesus dismisses him to go and do what he needs to do. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. I am he. I want to... I want to help us understand the significance of how Jesus responds here. The English word he is actually not in the original Greek. So when Jesus responds, I am he, he's not actually saying I am he, he's saying I am. It is the English translators that, that inserted the he's for our benefit so that we would know who Jesus is talking about. I am 
is the name God used to reveal himself as the eternal, the self-existing one. He did it to Moses. He did it to the Israelites back in the early parts of Scripture. You can go read that for yourself. So you see what Jesus is doing here? By saying, I am, he is referring to himself as God. Jesus is saying, he is almighty God, the eternal, the self-existing one. This is a powerful self-revelation of who Jesus is. Now, look at what happens next. This is incredible. What happens next is something that I, I haven't seen any other place in Scripture, haven't seen it in my life, and I haven't heard of anybody else in my life experiencing it. Verse 6. He says, When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Can you picture what happens here? This crowd of over 200, maybe 600, mostly soldiers, some officials in their official garb and peppered with a few slaves throughout, I imagine the excitement and the adrenaline is running through their veins as they approach this place that they've been told Jesus and his disciples are holding out. Remember, soldiers are ready for battle. It's their MO. They love it. It's what they're trained to do. They're ready for a confrontation here tonight. And they're probably in somewhat of a battle stance. But all Jesus does is answer their question by speaking the name of God, I am. And they fall back, they draw back, and they fall to the ground. Battle-hardened, grown men in battle gear draw back and fall to the ground even though no one touches them. No one touched them. It's an incredible display of the power of the spoken name of God. It's enough to blow this fierce crowd of fighting men over. Jesus isn't surprised. But this crowd sure is surprised. I can see the chaos. The shields and the swords and the clubs clanking around as they're falling to the ground and trying to get up again. And someone, someone yelling, get that torch out of my face. And someone else screaming in pain because of hot lamp oil is running on there and burning their leg. I imagine the surprise and the, and the embarrassed look as they're kind of standing up and straightening themselves up. Kind of figure out what happened. What just happened? But this doesn't even phase Jesus. He doesn't go to his friend, his disciples. Whoa, did you see that? Did you see what happened? Nor does he mock them. He doesn't make fun of them. He simply asks them again. Verse 7. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. Jesus answered. But then look at what Jesus says next. Look at what he does. Verse eight continues. It says, I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words had spoken, um, had, had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. You would think that Judas is in charge, but he was only leading this crowd to arrest Jesus. You'd think that maybe it was the captain of this detachment who was in charge or calling the shots for this arrest. You may even think it's the officials that the chief priest sent along to supervise these soldiers. But it's none of them. It's Jesus. Jesus is in charge. He instructs and more accurately commands the leaders of this arrest to leave his disciples out of it. And they do. How do we know that? Because of the bonehead move that Peter pulls next. Verse 10. He says, Then Peter, Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Melchus. The soldiers should have instantly reacted and killed Peter either on the spot or at least wrestled him to the ground, disarmed him, and arrested him. But they don't. It's almost as if they don't notice it. They don't even acknowledge what just happened. But again, Jesus is in charge, not them. For he says in verse 9, again, he says, This happened so that the words he had spoken, Jesus had spoken, would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. 
Peter doesn't see this arrest coming. He's surprised. He is completely caught off guard. And his fight flight response kicks in. He draws his sword and and then goes after probably who he perceives to be, A, the the weakest person near him, or at least the most unarmed man near him, and he lunges at Melchus. Melchus is a slave. Peter is a fisherman. I don't don't, um, expect Peter to be uh, very skilled in wielding a sword. Maybe a fishing rod, but not a sword. Verse 11 says this, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter was acting out of his own flesh, out of his natural fight response, but it doesn't go well. He's totally missing what's going on here. He's missing what God has planned almost since creation. And it creates a mess of the situation and a significant pain for Melchus. How often do we simply react out of our flesh? because of some probably negative surprise and we make a mess of the situation or we make a mess in the relationships around us? Are we even looking to God for what purpose he has in this negative surprise? Are we trusting God in this surprise? Are we, are we asking him to guide us through in our response? You know, many marriages have so much conflict because we simply react to each other rather than seeking to understand each other. We're not asking God's perspective of our relationship and what's going on. We're not even asking God's perspective of our reaction and perhaps our ungodly reactions to each other. In case you're wondering what happened to Melchus, well, Luke tells us that Jesus bends forward, he touches the place the man's ear used to be, and he heals him. Jesus does a merciful and gracious act even while this ruthless crowd were illegitimately arresting him. Can you imagine the surprise for this servant, Melchus? Usually slaves are not armed and he is with this large contingent of armed warriors and so he's probably thinking he's safe until he's not. He tries to duck Peter's lunge and suddenly feels the stabbing pain on the side of his head. What just happened? And with, his, with blood pouring from his cupped hands and running down his arm, this guy Jesus touches his ear and completely heals him. Like, completely. It's all there again. Now, none of the writers record what happens to Melchus after this night. But I imagine that he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. I imagine the surprise attack... And the, resp- the, the surprise response of healing by Jesus softens his heart towards Jesus. Verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. Let's pause for a moment. I'd like us to consider what's going on inside the disciples right now. This whole arrest scenario is a surprise to them. And it's not a good one. Jesus warned them many times what was going to happen, but they weren't picking up what Jesus was laying down. I imagine they felt very often, that, or that we would feel, the very same way that they were feeling in, in these moments. There's fear. What's going to happen to us? Am I going to get rested as well? There may have been confusion. I thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom on earth now. There perhaps was anger. Jesus has done nothing wrong. What on earth? Why on earth are you arresting him? And maybe there was a simple intrigue. How can Jesus be so calm during this? Their pounding hearts were probably jumping out of their chests. I think mine would have been. It's not in our text here in John. But the other gospel writers tell us that it's at this point that all the disciples flee. They scatter in all directions. Peter reacted in fight Everybody else now reacts in flee. They flee. How do we handle bad surprises? It's been said that it is in bad surprises where true character is exposed or it's revealed. We've all been surprised by COVID-19. How is it affecting you this last week? What's going on in your heart? 
What's going on in your emotions? You know, I have friends at Heartland and elsewhere who follow Jesus Christ and are not phased by this at all. They are living in wisdom and prudence, but not in fear and anxiety. You know, I was on the phone uh, with a neighbor the other day. He's older and said to me, he says, Barry, he says, I'm not concerned about me. I've lived my years. My life has been good. I am, if this takes me, I am ready to go. Well, he can say that because he knows where he's going to go after he dies. He's going to spend eternity with God. I've had a bad surprise this last week. And I've had to check my heart many times. Will I continue to trust and to pray like it all depends upon God? And, can, and at the same time, work like it all depends upon me? Or will I shrink back or allow fear and anxiety to paralyze me? Choking out my trust in God and my relationship with Him. Again, bad surprises expose the true character inside. Let's go back to our text. Verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrest Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Jump down to verse 19. It says the high priest questioned Jesus. Now in case you notice, Annas is not referred to as the high priest, but Caiaphas, his son-in-law, is here in verse 13. But then in verse 19, Annas is referred to as the high priest. Well, how does that work? Is the Bible wrong? Is it contradicting itself? Well, not at all. Because Israel was a theocracy, which is a system of government where priests rule the nation in the name of God, the high priest in New Testament times was the most influential and powerful person in, uh, in all of Israel save for the Roman governors and the Roman kings after Israel was conquered by them. It, it's like having a president emeritus, one who is retired from the position but still carries the title. Or as former prime ministers are often referred to for many years after they're done, their terms, pri as, as prime ministers, it, it, it's the same here. It, it's like once a high priest, always a high priest. So Annas was high priest from 6 A.D. to 15 A.D., some, but now some 18 years later, he is still referred to as that. But Annas wasn't just one name on the list of many high priests. He had become a legend. He eventually had all five of his sons become high priests, including a grandson. And the current high priest, Caiaphas, here in our text, is Annas' son-in-law. This guy is the father of the nation. He is the grand poobah, the most influential and powerful figure in the Jewish hierarchy. And notice, notice that this is who they bring Jesus to first. Not Caiaphas, not the sitting high priest. Well, Annas begins questioning Jesus. Verse 19. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. But this is not what happens in legal proceedings, or at least it's not supposed to be what happens in legal proceedings. Those of you who work in the legal system can probably explain this better than I can. In any court, charges are brought against a defendant, and then evidence is presented to back up those charges. The defendant, represented by his counsel, is called the defendant because they must then defend themselves or refute that evidence. But that's not what's happening here. The religious rulers had met back in chapter 11. In the timeline of John, that was about a week ago. To discuss their concern over the growing number of people who were following Jesus. Excited about who Jesus was and were following him. And their chilling conclusion was that Jesus had to die. That was the only way to eliminate his influence. But there was no evidence against Jesus that would warrant death. That deserved death. And so whatever proceedings they were going to have were not about innocence or guilt. But to simply put a veneer of legality upon their murder of Jesus. See what's going on here? Without any evidence, 
all Annas has is the hope of Jesus incriminating himself. So, he's thinking, let's ask Jesus some questions and maybe he'll talk himself into a corner. Well, this is illegal. It's illegal in Jewish law. Jewish law protected the accused from having to testify against themselves. It was Annas' responsibility to inform Jesus of the charges and then present the evidence against him. Instead, he asks these, these vague and general questions, hoping to uncover a crime to justify the, de the death sentence that they had already decided upon. This trial is a sham, and Jesus knows it. Verse 21. Verse 20, 21. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you need evidence, go get it yourself. If you want evidence warranting death, then let, you, then let them produce it. Jesus exposes this trial, this sham trial, and calls them on their fake and illegal trial. He demand, he, what he's doing, he's demanding a fair trial. Verse 22, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? This official is surprised. He's surprised by Jesus' response and the authority and the courage that Jesus has to, to come up against Annas like this. And he reacts immediately. For what? Well, Jesus knows his rights. And he knows the official was simply trying to save face for this old guy priest. But this official really had nothing to say. He had no rebuttal of Jesus. And so Annas, in a silent acknowledgement that Jesus is right, he's got nothing on him, he sends Jesus still bound to Caiaphas, the sitting high priest. That's verse 24. Now, knowing that Annas' approach didn't work, Caiaphas had to up the game. He brings in people who are willing to give false testimony essentially lying about what Jesus said or what he did. But none of them could get their story straight. As each witness was coming in, they kept contradicting each other. And you can read this for yourself in, in Matthew chapter 26. This is not working. Their game plan is falling apart. And Jesus knows it. So you know what he, so get this. You know what he does? He helps them out. He's been silent in so many opportunities to defend himself, but knowing that this whole time, uh, that this is the divine plan. It's the sovereign design of Almighty God that he suffer and die, giving his life for the sin of all people everywhere. This is ve the very thing that Jesus volunteered for. And so, he does. He helps them out. You'll read in Matthew 26 how Jesus finally speaks up when he's asked a direct question. Matthew 26, verse 63 says this. The high priest, that's Caiaphas, said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, here it is. <clears throat> you have said it. And in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Blasphemy! Why do we need other witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. Then they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, jeering, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you that time? It's fascinating to study the Jewish judicial system. It is based on the principles and the practices that God laid out in Leviticus, um, uh, um, in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy earlier on in the Bible and right near the beginning. 
When properly administered, the Jewish system of justice was, was not only blisteringly fair, but it was also merciful. But it is just as blisteringly obvious that Jesus' trial here was anything but fair or merciful. The Sanhedrin, which is the top religious council in all of Israel, violated virtually every principle of its own system of jurisprudence. Let me just name six of them. Jesus was illegally tried without first having been charged with a crime. He was tried at night where no one could attend and see. And it was done in private instead of public where everyone could hear. He was not given any defense counsel. The, witness against, the witnesses against him had been bribed to falsify their testimony. And then lastly, he was executed on the same day that he was tried instead of waiting the three days for those people to fast, to consider their verdict, and to adjust it if necessary. The trial of, against Jesus was a complete sham from beginning to end. But this didn't surprise Jesus. He knew it all along. Because he wanted you and he wanted me to know him personally. He wanted us to receive forgiveness of our sin. He wanted us to experience freedom from shame and guilt and condemnation. He wants us to experience his love for real inside and to sense his presence and to depend upon his power. He knew exactly how this was all going to go down before it ever started. Before it ever started in the heart and the intent of those who were out to kill him. Jesus bore well under the pressure he faced in, this, in these religious trials. And he wasn't done. Next week we're going to look at the, the civil trials before Pilate and before Herod and the consequential suffering that he endures. But when surprises hit us, we're not Jesus. I know that. We usually don't see them coming. We're broadsided by them. So can I encourage you? Consider the internal thoughts and emotions during the time of a nasty surprise. What are the tapes that play inside that you hear running? What occupies the majority of your mental and your emotional space? Where is God in your internal space inside? Can I encourage you to reflect on your actions or your reactions to those around you? How are you treating them? Are you short-tempered? Or are you gracious and patient? And then on a lighter note, can I encourage those of you who are introverts and probably loving this whole social distancing thing to look out for your extrovert brothers, sisters, friends, small group because they may not be doing so well during this time. Connect with them. Help them out. Well, at the end of this podcast... Uh, there's a couple screens with some discussion questions and also some personal reflection. Will you take a few moments with those that you're with right now, sitting in your living room or wherever you are, and talk through some of those discussion questions. And then take a few moments to reflect on some of the personal reflection questions. Before we close, or as we close, I'd like to bless you. Today, I'd like to bless you from Numbers chapter 6, uh, verse 22. It reads this way. Nope, that's not it. You can edit this, right? I don't know where it is. I'd like to bless you from uh, Numbers chapter 6. That's what it is. I already said that, didn't I? Okay, it says this. 
we often hold our hands out like this just to re as, as receiving a blessing. So I encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable. If you feel weird on your couch, that's okay. But I bless you with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. I bless you, every one of you, in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for joining us today.